Hello guys and gals and welcome to um, Ladder Starter Tips. So I'm going to be going over 10 tips for those of you who are going to be starting Ladder. Especially if you are brand new to Ladder and this is your first Ladder in Diablo 2 Resurrected, I would recommend that you take a look at this entire video. In fact, I'm also going to have links down in the description to individual rune words and other things that may be helpful for you on your Ladder journey. But what this is supposed to be is for those of you who don't really have a strong understanding of ladder and uh, and as cow king will let you know he um he wants you to uh, to do well because you know he wants to be able to fight you in hell difficulty and kick your butt and uh, and that is uh, the cow king's goal he wants as many adventurers to get there so he can demolish you and laugh and pee on your corpse so <laughs> without further ado let's get into tip number one Tip number one is low-level rune words. These are rune words that are exceptionally low-level um, and can be utilized by most characters at a relatively easy point in the game. Um, the first and foremost is the stealth armor, which is Tal Eth. Tal Eth is extremely easy to get to. Uh, this is a great armor for low-level casters and honestly just about everybody. And it really just doesn't have a lot of super big downsides. There are better armors than this for a low-level character. Don't get me wrong. If I was building my ideal character, if I had, you know, just like the, the, the pick of the litter, so to speak, for equipment, I would probably not choose stealth because stealth is not really that great compared to some of the other choices. But it is extremely easy to come by, and this is the reason why a lot of people will use it. Um, it's a very good armor for how easy it is to come by, and eventually you will come across something better, and that's fine. Uh, we also have Peace, which is a relatively low level Amazon armor uh, with plus two to skills and extremely cheap at Shale Thal Am. Now, when you first start ladder, um, that's not going to be cheap. But if you do manage to save up yourself a Shale Thal and an Am, this can be an absolutely great choice for a lot of characters, not just Amazons, but also maybe a Zeal Paladin. Uh, simply because of the critical strike. So paladins and druids and many other characters in the game don't actually have access to critical strike, unlike the barbarian, the amazon, and the assassin. So having access to critical strike early on, or essentially deadly strike, which is kind of what it is, uh, is going to give you basically a way to dish out double damage that you wouldn't otherwise normally have. Um, and it could be kind of interesting. We also have a Myth, which is one that you can use for Barbarians, and it's uh, great for a low-level Barbarian at Hell Am Nef, and can help you get some extra uh, battle orders and shouts and things like that going. Uh, only level 25 requirement, and quite honestly, it's not even really that uh, <laughs> hard to put on. With the Hell Rune involved in its creation also, it's going to have a relatively low strength requirement, so you can put this in a pretty high strength piece of equipment and get that negative 15% requirements on top. Uh, we also have the Lore Helmet, and uh, the Lore Helmet is a really cheap plus one to skill helmet, which can also be made in Barbarian and Druid helmets, uh, so you can get plus one to skills with other skills, which is definitely very nice. And, uh, and, and the reason why I'm showing you all these is because they are extremely cheap rune words that can be made extremely early at ladder um, if you are savvy enough to find the right base and, uh, and keep the right runes. Uh, we also have Nadir. Now, Nadir is not exactly the greatest helmet in the world, and uh, honestly, though, it's not really that expensive either. At Neftir, it is one of the easiest helmets to make and can certainly help you quite a bit um, in the early parts of the game. The level 13 Cloak of Shadow Charges is also actually pretty darn sweet. Um, it will reduce all the defense of all the monsters nearby and can actually be utilized really nicely to uh, help prevent monsters from being able to see you. If you've never actually used Cloak of Shadows, um, I would recommend that you at least give it a try because Cloak of Shadows is just really awesome. Uh, the only downside to Cloak of Shadows is that it can't be spammed. So you want to make sure that you have those monsters on the screen um, and you use Cloak of Shadows on them so that they go, uh, you know, th th their eyeballs just close like this and they can't see you anymore. Um, it, uh, it, like I said, it makes them blind and it also reduces their defense. And believe it or not, it also increases your defense. So just a really nice ability all around. And although you probably won't have the gold to repair the charges, because Neff and Tear are extremely cheap, you could very easily use the charges, throw the helmet away, and make another one. A disposable Nadir Cloak of Shadows, if you will. 
Uh, we also have a little bit more of an expensive recipe at Nef Lum, which is smoke. And this is usually something that you make as you're getting into nightmare difficulty, because in nightmare difficulty, you're going to have a lot of issues with resistances, uh, especially as a brand new starter ladder character. Um, and smoke can definitely help a lot in that regard. Uh, we also have uh, Ancient's Pledge, which is super duper cheap to make, and we'll go over why this is actually super duper cheap to make uh, later. But you can actually uh, very easily get yourself a Rao or Tal. And, uh, and with the resistances that it adds, it can be combined with a smoke, and you will be very well off as far as resistances are concerned. Uh, you can make it in any three socket shield, including paladin only shields, and those paladin only shields can get a massive bump in resistances. In fact, if you can find a 45 to all resistance shield and throw Ralort Tal in there, you're going to be looking at 48% plus 45%, which is going to be a pretty massive amount of resistances. Uh, we also have Spirit, and Spirit can be created in both paladin shields and regular shields and uh, and it will actually go much nicer in a paladin shield uh don't get me wrong this one is ethereal for some reason i don't really know why but um if you are looking for a four socket shield to make yourself a spirit in for a regular character it has to be a monarch uh which is unfortunate the monarch shield is um a relatively high level shield um however for paladins, paladins can actually make a spirit um, in a relatively low level shield and get really, really nice effects from spirit early on because paladins have access to four socket shields much, 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 much sooner than everybody else. Um, there is also this shield, which is honestly one of my favorite low-level shields to make, which is the Rhyme Shield. The Rhyme Shield is Shale F, extremely cheap, uh, the Shale being the most expensive rune in the recipe, and uh, quite honestly provides you with a very nice plethora of bonuses. Um, not only does it give you 25% extra magic find, 50% extra gold for monsters, cannot be frozen, and all resistance is 25, but it's actually a fairly good blocking shield too, with 40% faster block rate and 20% increased chance of blocking. All in all, if if you pay attention to this list of rune words and you utilize these to your advantage, not this one, this one sucks. Um, <laughs> don't look at that one, that one's terrible. I don't even know that one's in the list. No, don't do it. Um, you will do very, fairly well. Now this one I was a little bit um, hesitant to include. This one is Splendor. But since I included uh, Smoke, which is Nephilim, I figured I might as well include Splendor. Uh, Splendor is a very nice plus one to all skill shield. Um, it does have faster casts on it, and it can actually be made at a relatively low level. Uh, with the effects that Splendor has, it can actually be a pretty decent placeholder shield for sorceresses, um, necromancers, and all sorts of characters. Uh, specifically, though, necromancers, because necromancers can make this in a head. It's only two sockets. And, uh, and the Lumbrune is not so ridiculously expensive that you won't be able to get your hands on these. So what you do is you look for a really nice necromancer head that has the plus the skills that you want, like maybe plus three uh, clay golem and plus three uh, you know lower resist or something. And then once you find that uh, that particular head with two sockets, or or you socket it at large to get your two sockets, you're going to put Ethelum in there, and that's going to give you another plus one to skills on top of the plus three plus three, which is very very nice. And then you have a total of plus four. Um, this is actually a pretty good stopgap shield. Um, most people will choose between either uh, one of these three shields early on unless they happen to find something better. Um, one of the very nice unique items, but you can never really count on the unique items. And this is the reason why rune words tend to be a little bit more um, amazing in this regard. Um, so keep in mind, Ancient's Pledge, Splendor, and Rhyme Shields are three of the very nice early game shield. Now, uh, Spirit is not really so much of an early game shield because most characters are not going to be able to make it until they get themselves a Monarch, so keep that in mind. But it could technically be an early game shield for a Paladin, uh, specifically because Paladins, you know, uh, get that, that really sweet early game access to those items. Now, Spirit can also be created in a, uh, a weapon as well. And uh, when you create it in a weapon, it doesn't have the good resistances on it that it does when it's a shield, so to keep that in mind. But it is fairly nice as well. Uh, one of the things that people will usually make Spirits in early on is a four-socket crystal sword or broadsword, uh, which can be gotten from the cow level in normal difficulty and socketed at Larzic to get four sockets. After that, you can usually find four-socket crystal swords relatively easily, uh, but, uh, but in normal difficulty, 
see you will generally only find three socket crystal swords um, and but in the cow level specifically if you find a crystal sword from the cow level it should be the right level to socket at larzic for four sockets uh, we also have the uh, insight polar now the insight polearm has recently got a very interesting change in that it can be made in the bows, which is freaking awesome. And the bow girl has also got an interesting change that she can utilize uh, Amazon only bows. So if you could find yourself a four socket Amazon only bow, uh, you could have some pretty sweet uh, stuff with this. Now the reason why people love to make insight is because of the meditation, which is a massive mana regeneration. And this can come in handy very, very nicely at the beginning of ladder when a lot of characters are having a lot of mana issues. I do feel it's important to point out, though, that uh, meditation does not work very well on characters that have low mana pools. The way that it actually works is it's basically a percentage of your mana pool, and the lower your mana pool is, the, the more, you know, tiny it is, the less it actually affects you. And, uh, and so you want to get your mana pool up as high as you possible so that something like this can actually do its magic. Um, insight and Spirit um, are both very interesting rune words, but the problem with both of them is that you generally have an issue finding four socket items in normal difficulty. So you're not usually going to end up with one of these right off the bat. Now, um, I've gone over quite a few rune words, and there are some other ones, some, uh, some honorable mentions like Steel, uh, Malice, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to have all these rune words available to you guys to click on down in the description of the video. Um, so anything that I mention that I talk about, I'm going to give you guys some additional guides to go over. I don't want this video to be 18 hours long, uh, and it very well could be, uh, so, you know, just keep it at that. Uh, we're going to move on to the next topic, uh, which is obtaining runes. So you've got all these beautiful, lovely rune words. Well, how do you obtain them? Well, for the most part, most monsters in the game have a chance to drop runes. And early on in the game, one of the monsters that you're going to farm on a regular basis is known as the Countess. The Countess has a pretty good chance to drop a large number of runes, and she can honestly be an extremely good choice for a lot of characters. Um, she is always in the same place, uh, so if you've never seen her before, uh, basically what you do is you go to Black Marsh. If you don't have Black Marsh, you can go to Outer Cloister, and uh, what you're going to do is you're going to teleport there. On Dariel's stronghold. Evil beware. Now, this is a 200% faster cast sorceress, so don't be too jealous. Don't be too jealous, my boys. And as you can see, my mana is completely uh, worn away, which probably because I don't have any points in the warmth. Let me go stack that real quick just for laughs. There we go. Now we're in the Black Marsh. And what you're looking for in the Black Marsh is a tower. Oh, let me grab that waypoint. I need that. Uh, you're looking for a tower. Uh, the tower is really obvious and really uh, conspicuous. And it's usually, usually not 100% of the time, but usually near the waypoint. So I usually recommend doing a kind of a circle around the waypoint um, just kind of just to be absolutely 100% sure. Because in my experience, um, if you do like a circle around the waypoint, you will usually find it. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to run in here and you're going to kill all the monsters and you're going to try and find the, the, the Countess. The Countess is a great place for runes and, uh, and generally the Countess's zone tends to kind of travel like a clock. And if you take advantage of the way that her area is built, you'll notice that the entrance and the next level down are usually kind of like in a, a counterclockwise direction. Um, I found that if you kind of go in a counterclockwise direction with her, it usually works. I'm not going to say it always works, but it usually works. Um, sometimes, though, it doesn't quite work out that way. But as you can see, again, another counterclockwise direction. And let's see if this one is going to be counterclockwise as well. Not quite, but interesting. Um, and then once you're on level 5, uh, there's a lot of stuff here. You can get all the uh, gold and the treasure chests down here. There's another gold and treasure chest over here. There's usually several elite groups of monsters. And then there's also the Countess herself, which will always talk to you about uh, blood baths and, and blood will boil. Now, when you kill her, she is going to drop you, usually between, I believe it's zero. She can drop as many as zero 
to six runes. Um, that is her maximum number of runes. So zero to six. Um, in the early parts of the game, like for instance in normal difficulty, as Cow King will attest, um, she can only drop, I believe, up to a Ral rune, which is still pretty good. Uh, you can then transmute up those Ral runes and you can get something better. Um, the normal, sorry, nightmare difficulty, she has much higher drops, and in hell difficulty, she can drop much higher runes. Of course, farming her is going to be a little bit more difficult. Uh, but basically, if you are trying to get runes for early stuff, like for instance, uh, to make yourself a stealth armor, or to make yourself a, uh, you know, a, an insight pole arm, or something like that, as you can see, I managed to get a Nef rune. I managed to get an Ith rune and a Tal rune. The Tal rune was used in quite a few of the recipes um, that we had just recently looked at. It's used in Stealth. Um, it was used in the uh, Ancient's Pledge, Ral or Tal. It was used in the um, the Spirit. It was used in the, uh, you know, it, just, just quite a large number of recipes that Tal runes are useful for. So a very nice find there for an early liner character. Um, the Nef rune also had several uses. Um, it was useful in the, uh, the Smoke rune word. It was useful in... The um, the Nadir, I believe, it was also useful in one of the others. So, you know, as you go forward and you gather up runes, you're going to be able to, to make more and more stuff. But are there any other places that you can find runes from? Well, yes, definitely. Um, there are actually two other places that I always recommend that you guys do um, every single time you have a chance. So uh, let's go to... Actually, you know what? Let's go to Nightmare Difficulty. Make it a little bit easier on myself, or we can just go to Normal. It doesn't really matter. Uh, because the quest is the same for each difficulty setting. And I would definitely recommend that if you're a brand new starter character in Ladder, that you don't skip these quests. Um, number one is the River of Flame Mephisto's Soul Stone. So when you come down here to uh, get the Soul Stone destroyed, you're going to come across Hephesto the Armorer. Um, Hephaesto the Armor has a quest where he will basically um, drop a hammer, and the hammer allows you to crush Mephisto Soulstone on the altar, uh, or rather the, the smith shop. Uh, when you smash his Soulstone on the altar, which is right here, um, you basically get one random rune combined with one random rune combined with um, a whole bunch of gems. And this can come in really, really handy for a lot of players. Um, each individual player can do this quest, and so each individual player can get their own set of runes, which is really freaking awesome. And, uh, and I think you will find that uh, this particular quest can be a really big boon to help you on your way to, uh, to making your characters a little bit more viable. Um, you might get something really nice from these quests, and you also might get something that's pretty garbage. But the gems also, you will usually end up getting one or two flawlesses and maybe one or two perfects, as well as some normals, and, uh, and those can also be utilized for some very good effect to, uh, to upgrade items, um, for socketing, like for instance, if you're going to go early magic find and find some topazes, um, you can usually end up with some nice things from these quests. So don't skip your Hephaesto the Armor quest, um, and also, another quest that you don't want to skip is the Barbarian Rescue quest. So remember earlier when we were talking about how many different items were available uh, with the Tal rune, right? The Tal rune is just one of those really great runes. Well, you can get one for free. In fact, you can get several for free. So in Act 5, when you finally do get to Act 5, uh, there is a quest to rescue the Barbarians. Um, the quest is a relatively easy quest. It's right here. It's called Rescue on Mount Ariat. Um, you start it by talking to Quail Kick, and then once you have started the quest, um, you go to Frigid Highlands, and in Frigid Highlands, when you teleport around, you will see these little cages. Inside the cages are the Barbarians. Now, I've already rescued these, but inside of here would be the Barbarians, and you would open the cage, let the Barbarians out, and when you do, and when you go back to town, Qualkek will give you a set of runes to create an Ancient's Pledge. Um, he basically gives you a set of runes specifically for that rune word, but you don't have to use them for that rune word. He's going to give you Ral, Ort, and Tal. So you get a free Ral rune, a free Ort rune, and a free Tal rune. And this is already enough to create yourself, obviously, an Ancient's pre Pledge, but also look at the uh, spirit rune word. It is Tal, Thul, Ort, Am, right? So Tal and Ort are two of the runes that you need 
to make a spirit rune word. And a lot of people will like to roll spirit rune words over and over again just so they can try and get like the higher, faster cast and, uh, and the better stats, which is definitely a nice thing to do. Um, now, you also can get other types of items. So, for instance, it's not just runes. You can also get free rings. So, one of the things that a lot of people don't remember is that uh, Akara and Ormus will both give you free rings when you do a specific quest. And um, that quest is the Den of Evil and the uh, Gibbon Dagger. Now, in normal difficulty, when you complete, 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 <laughs> when you complete the Den of Evil quest, uh, the Den of Evil will only give you a magic ring, and it's not too great. However, when you complete the Act 3 Ormus quest, the Gibbon Dagger, he will give you a rare ring. Now, sometimes this rare ring is absolutely garbage, and sometimes this rare ring is absolutely amazing. But here's the thing. When you're a starter ladder character, jewelry is often one of the most difficult things to come by. And getting a free rare ring from Ormus can be a huge boon. Uh, the Gibbon quest is uh, do, do, do this one right here, the Blade of the Old Religion. Um, so make sure that when you are in normal difficulty, you do the Blade of the Old Religion quest, get your free rare ring. It could be amazing. It could be garbage, but it's probably still going to be better than the plus one max damage ring that you're wearing when you start. Um, another very important quest to do is, um, is the Act 1 Den of Evil quest. Now, when you do the Act 1 Den of Evil quest in Nightmare and Hell difficulty, Akara will also give you a rare ring. Unfortunately, she only gives you a magic ring in normal difficulty, but in Nightmare difficulty, that rare ring that she gives you can be freaking epic. You've just left normal difficulty, you've just killed normal Bale, and quite honestly, you are probably hurting for resistances, uh, faster cast, HP, strength, all sorts of things, because Nightmare is a real pain in the butt when you first get there. And having a free ring from the Den of Evil can be a really, really nice boon. Now moving on to the next topic, uh, which is gambling specific gear. So what were we just talking about? We were talking about not having good equipment, right? Not having good I'm rings and not having good amulets. Well, one of the interesting things that you can do is you can save up your money and you can try and gamble for some good rings and amulets. Um, I was lucky enough to gamble myself a High Lord's Wrath uh, last time uh, Diablo 2 Resurrected started, and, uh, and I hope to repeat something similar to that. But gambling rings and amulets can actually be very profitable. However, it is important to note that the level of the amulet that you are gambling is dependent on the level of your character. So if you gamble for amulets and rings at a relatively low level, you will get relatively low level amulets and rings. And that is just how it works. So, you know, make sure that as a character, um, you are gambling at the right levels. Um, I usually like to try and gamble for some amulets, um, usually by the time I hit like level 30 or 40, um, just simply because I usually don't have anything good in this slot, and I would like to have something good in this slot. Um, and on top of that, you can gamble things like uh, teleport amulets. You can get all sorts of interesting things. Uh, let's do a quick gamble real quick. Um, and we'll just take a look and see at what we get and if any of it is worthwhile. Now, do keep in mind this is really expensive. And you're probably going to want to make yourself either an edge bow or find yourself a geeds or both if, you, if it's all possible. So as you can see here, not good. Plus two passive and magic Amazon, not really that great. Although it could be useful for an early starter ladder character. Uh, poison resist, not good. Three to defensive aura, it's not really that great for paladins. Um, defensive tends to be the not great aura. Uh, we got Grim Ward charges, could be kind of fun to play around with. Uh, although I don't know if I really would. Uh, magic fine amulet, oh, there we go, look at that. Plus one to Sorcerer's Skills, all resistances, 17. Absolutely a great amulet to find early ladder. That, honestly, would be um, probably your amulet until you got yourself something like a, uh, a Mara's or a, uh, a really nice crafted amulet with faster cast rate. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Damage reduced by 22. Uh, mana, gold. Uh, that's an all-res amulet with some attack rating. Not terrible for a low-level 19 character. Uh, that one is plus one offensive auras with all resistances 18. Could be a stopgap for something like uh, Hammered In, maybe. Uh, we got some other crappy ones here. Nothing good, nothing good. Uh, plus one Paladin with uh, two resistances and damage reduced by four. 
Um, so as you can see here, um, gambling for amulets can sometimes be extremely profitable, especially if you end up with something like this, which can carry you for quite some time until you end up getting something better. Um, and not always are the amulets good. You know, sometimes they're absolutely garbage. As you saw, most of the amulets that we purchased were just absolute trash. And, uh, and that is unfortunately the way that the cookie crumbles in a lot of scenarios. But keep in mind, that um, it can actually pay off if you're extremely lucky with this. Um, but here's the problem with this, and that's gold. So if you're going to do some sort of gambling system for a low-level paladin, that's actually pretty sweet, plus one paladin, 28 strength. Um, that could actually be super good early on for a paladin, uh, especially if you're doing a low-strength build. Not bad, plus one paladin, 28 strength. Um, so where do you get all your gold from? Well, that's kind of an important one. Um, and gold is important. So gold is important in an early ladder character, um, especially for a lot of reasons. Number one, you need gold to resurrect your mercenary. You need gold to be able to, um, you know, gamble for items. You need gold to buy potions. You need gold for keys. You need gold for tons and tons of things in this game. Um, and, uh, and quite honestly, if you don't have gold, you're going to be having a pretty poor time in ladder. But here's the thing. In Ladder, we, of course, all start with very little gold. So how do you find yourself a large amount of gold in the Ladder at start? Well, the answer to that question is, is you need to know what to sell. Now, very briefly, I can go over that, but I actually do have a video, which I'm going to link down in the description. And, uh, and it basically goes over all the items that you can pick up to sell for gold. Another way that you can do it, though, is you can also have items that increase the amount of gold that you find. So things like uh, Gahid's Fortune, uh, Chance Guards, uh, Gold Wrap, uh, Gold Skin. There's all sorts of items in the game that have increased gold from monsters, so that every time you kill a monster, you get much more gold from that monster than you normally would, which is definitely very nice. Now, very briefly, uh, to go over a list of items that have a very good sell value, uh, armors have very good sell value. Generally, um, any armor that's above a Nightmare class armor, uh, especially the higher tier armors, will almost always sell for cap gold. And you might be asking me, well, what is cap gold? Well, in normal difficulty, Act 1, the maximum amount of gold that you can get from selling an item is 5,000. In Act 2, it's 10,000. Act 3 is 15,000. Act 4 is 20,000. Act 5 is 25,000. Nightmare is 30,000. And Hell difficulty is 35,000. So that's what I mean by capped gold. Now, uh, class items will sell for a lot of gold. And the reason why class items will sell for a lot of gold is because of the class skill on the item. So the higher the skill is, the more it is worth. Um, as you can see here, Sanctuary, which is a relatively high level skill, and Vigor, it's a level relatively high level skill and this item is worth 203,762 gold um, when you look at items what you are looking at for class items is the level of the skill the higher the level of the skill the more gold it will sell for in other words warmth which is a level one skill is like zero gold you ain't gonna get nothing for it okay whereas fire mastery which is a level 30 skill is going to give you tons and tons of gold. In fact, normally if you see a staff that has plus three fire mastery, it's almost always going to sell for 35,000. Now the individual skills in between here, so as you can see we've got uh, skills like uh, Ice Blast, which are level 6 skills, right? Or, or something like that. Yeah, level 6. Um, then we've got level 12 skills. We've got level 18 skills. We've also got level 24 skills and level 30 skills. So classify each one of these in your mind as very valuable, valuable, kind of valuable, moderately valuable, not really valuable, not valuable at all. Okay, those that's how you should classify these. And uh, and if you have an item, for instance, that has like plus three cold mastery, plus three blizzard, uh, plus three chilling armor or something, you know that's going to be worth thirty five thousand. But also take into account that it could potentially be worth more than that in trade value to someone who might want that particular item. Maybe not a staff specifically, but necromancer heads, necromancer wands, paladin uh, scepters, all sorts of interesting things in the game that are class items can be very valuable in the right setting. You know, like if you found a plus three tornado, plus three hurricane, uh, plus three cyclone armor, uh, druid pelt with two sockets, you would literally be able to fetch probably a jaw rune for that thing or more. Um... 
So if you want to look over that video, I do have that video down in the description for you. It's going to say, you know, uh, how to find gold or something like that, or gold, what is it good for, or something like that. Um, and I do recommend that you go over that one if you've had issues in the past trying to get yourself gold because, quite honestly, it's, uh, it's pretty easy once you get the hang of it. Um, another thing that I want to go over is um, skill-based damage is king. Okay? When you have no equipment, when your weapon is a rusty spoon and... Uh, Oh no, Mr. Cowking. When your weapon is a rusty spoon and your and your armor is tattered paper, um, oftentimes the best ally that you can possibly have is skill-based damage. Not elemental-based damage, not spell-based damage, but skill-based damage. Any character can do this, but they have to do it properly. Sorceresses are one of the best characters for this because obviously most of their damage is skill-based damage. Um, they have, you know, things like uh, enchant, which is elemental fire. You know, they got fireballs and meteors and 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 blaze and firewall, and they got lightning bolts and they got novas and all of this is very elemental damage. One of the issues that sorceresses has sorceresses have is um, the mana cost, mana cost problems. Uh, but let's very quickly go over each character. Now, I do have I do have deep dive videos into each one of these if you guys are interested. But this is going to be a very brief explanation, and I do feel like it's important to go over this kind of stuff. So, for the Paladin, what are skill-based damage effects? So, not melee, not ranged, not elemental, just what is a skill-based damage effect which can do very well on this character. So for Paladin, the best skill-based damage effects that they have are number one, Holy Fire, number two, Holy Freeze, number three, Holy Shock, and number four, Blessed Hammer. These are skill-based damage effects. So what that means is, is that as you level them up, the damage increases, which means that you don't need equipment, you don't need some god sword to make it work. All you need is skill points. You can literally be naked, and you can still do pretty good damage punching somebody with maximum holy fire. And that is the beauty of skill-based damage. Now, later on, when you gear up your character properly, when you are able to get him the right equipment, you can change this, and you can go to a more uh, melee-based damage or, you know, physical-based damage. Or you can go to a skill, you know, like, like Sacrifice or Zeal or Vengeance. And even Vengeance, by the way, is not skill-based damage. I do not recommend building venge Vengeance unless you have a good weapon. Um, let's take some other characters, for example. So if we were to go to a um, assassin. All right, so let's take a look at the assassin tree. What is skill-based damage and what is not? So the martial arts tree, um, pretty much right off the bat, starts out with non-skill-based damage. Tiger Strike is a non-skill-based damage. However, uh, Fists of Fire, Claws of Thunder, Blades of Ice, and Phoenix Strike are all skill-based damage, which means that as you increase the level of these, the damage goes up considerably. Um, some of these are not, though. They go off the weapon damage of your weapon. So keep in mind that some of these are going to be very restricted to how much damage your weapon is doing, and some of these are not. Um, for instance, uh, one of them that is very similarly uh, elemental damage, but is not actually based off of its own damage, is the uh, skill Dragon Tail. So it does fire damage, but it's a percentage based off your weapon, not the same thing as, uh, say, Blades of Ice or Claws of Thunder, which is a straight elemental damage based on the level of the skill. Uh, we also have the Trap Tree. The Trap Tree is very nice for elemental damage, um, or rather skill-based damage. The Blade Sentinel, Blade Fury, and Blade Shield abilities go off of your weapon damage. So these are probably not ones that you want to build right away as an assassin. However, uh, Fire Blast, Wake of Fire, Wake of Inferno, Shockweb, Charge Bolt Sentry, Lightning Sentry, and Death Sentry are all very skill-based damage and can be extremely good on a character that is even naked. Let's move on to another character. Let's take a look at um, Amazon. So uh, here is the Amazon, and uh, the Amazon has some very nice skill-based damage on both the uh, bow and crossbow and 
the javelin and spear skill tree. Uh, whether you want to be a melee javelin or throwing a javelin or whether you want to use a bow, a bow there is a lot of good elemental damage builds uh, for the Zon. Uh, number one is the exploding arrow slash immolation arrow build. Um, this is a build that focuses almost entirely on fire and works extremely well for the Amazon in a lot of regards. Fire does tend to drop off very quickly in uh, Nightmare Difficulty Act 4, um, and after that it, you do need another element, but it can be extremely effective. Um, also, the Freezing Arrow ability is extremely effective uh, because it freezes targets and shatters them into a million pieces. And quite honestly, Freezing Arrow Zons can do very well up until uh, pretty much Hell Difficulty. And at that point, they pretty much just have to spec into something else so that they have another ability other than Cold. Uh, the Javelin and Spear skill tree, um, if you are a Spear Zon... The Power Strike, Charge Strike, and Lightning Strike are extremely skill-based damage and can do you extremely well, even with very poor equipment. Um, in fact, you can literally just use a white javelin that you can purchase pretty much just from Charcy um, in Act 1. I mean, you can literally just walk to Charcy, you can go over here, you can buy one javelin, and you can use that javelin uh, pretty much the entire time you play through if that's what you want to do. Um, also... Uh, Lightning Fury is a very skill-based damage as well, um, and that is the Throne skill. So if you plan on building a Lightning Zon early on, Lightning Zons can be extremely effective, even with relatively poor equipment. Uh, let's take a look at Barbarians real quick, because Barbarians is an odd one. So Barbarians are the masters of weapons, and unfortunately this does mean that Barbarians tend to be very weapon-based. Um, it doesn't matter what weapon you use, whether it's a, a sword, a dagger, an axe, a mace, a pole arm, a throwing item, or a spear, every single one of these is going to be a physical-based weapon that is going to bear very wildly upon what you have in your hand. In fact, the majority of these abilities that the Barbarian has are very, very non-skill-based damage, which means that they require a good weapon. Um, bash, Double Swing, Double Throw, Frenzy, Stun, Concentrate, even Berserk, which does magic damage, has to have a good weapon to convert physical to magical damage. Uh, leap, Leap Attack, and Whirlwind are all extremely physical damage skills, which makes the entire combat tree and the combat mastery uh, uh, masteries pretty lackluster in terms of skill-based damage. You can, of course, get lucky, find a good weapon on a Barbarian, and do very well, but it's a little difficult. Uh, they do, however, have some skill-based damage in the form of War Cries, um, and, uh, and mainly the, uh, the War Cry skill. Uh, War Cry is a skill-based damage effect, which is an AoE very similar to uh, Nova or Frost Nova, if you've ever used those on the Sorceress, and, uh, and it is governed by faster cast rate, which means that you can spam it relatively nicely. <coughs> Hmm. Now, when you look at the Barbarian and you see that he doesn't really have a lot of skill-based damage, it does make him look very, very poor as a ladder starter character. But he does have a way to augment his poor ability at the beginning, and that is the Find Item ability. So the Find Item ability for the Barbarian can actually function as a way to get himself a good weapon so that he can utilize one of these abilities. Um, this is one way that he's able to overcome uh, kind of this disadvantage that a lot of other players can't. If you're a paladin and you're looking for a really nice weapon to zeal with, well, good luck. But as a barbarian, you can run around the battlefield after the battle is over and hork a bunch of corpses and maybe find yourself a nice sword, an axe, or a mace, or just something to swing at somebody's head. Who knows? Maybe it's a chair. <laughs> as long as it does damage. Uh, let's take a look at the... Druid next, shall we? The Druid is an interesting one uh, because the Druid has a lot of good choices for skill-based damage. Um, a lot, actually. And uh, and it's actually quite surprising just how many choices the druid has for skill-based damage. So right off the bat, um, uh, let's talk about the Hurricane, Tornado, and Twister Tree. This is very skill-based damage. Um, this is a very easy way that you can build a starter druid. The problem with it is that Twister is a level 18 skill and Tornado is a level 24 skill, so you really can't build this at the start of the game. However, once you get into like Nightmare Difficulty, this can be an extremely powerful skill-based build, which can help you travel a lot further. 
of the Firestorm, the Bolt and Boulder, and the Fissure, um, these can actually be really, really powerful early skill-based damage as well. In fact, Fissure tends to be really overpowered in normal difficulty, and quite honestly just takes out just about everything. A Fissure Druid at early ladder will have absolutely no problem powering through normal difficulty, and uh, honestly will have not much difficulty in Nightmare either. Uh, it's not until they get to Act 4 Nightmare where they encounter a lot of fire immunes that things start to go bad. Um, as a werewolf or a bear druid, there actually are some very interesting skill-based damage effects that you can go with. Uh, number one is the rabies ability, which is highly skill-based and doesn't really require too many points to invest. Um, the fire claws ability, which can be used by both the bear and the werewolf, also has extremely nice fire damage, which is skill-based, and that skill-based damage is actually really nice early ladder. Um, as I talked about before with the fire characters, uh, they tend not to do very well once you get to Act 4 Nightmare, because that's where the majority of the fire immunes start to appear. Um, as a Zoo Druid, which is a brand new thing, if you guys have not seen it before, you can now summon all of your, uh, your animals at once. You can summon all five ravens. Uh, you can summon all of your wolvies. You can summon uh, all of your dire wolvies, and you can summon your bear at the same time. Now, what does this mean? Well, this means that the summon tree has now become one of the most amazing skill-based damage trees for the druid. Um, it may not prove to be super effective in hell difficulty, but I can tell you for a fact that I have played around with summon druids in the early stages of the game um, before they were capable of summoning their entire horde of, of uh, wolves and bears and uh, and quite honestly in the previous version of the game before they got this they were absolutely amazing in normal difficulty um, if you've never played a zoo druid through normal difficulty up to nightmare and maybe even through nightmare difficulty up into hell um, i would recommend it because it's a very fun adventure and you can build tons and tons of magic find um, on your character because obviously None of what your character is wearing is important to a zoo druid because literally your zoo druid is pretty much entirely just skill based damage. Now, later on, if you actually were going to build your zoo druid for hell difficulty, you'd have to get plus to skills, um, you know, wear the right equipment for that plus to skills, and so forth and so on. But early game zoo druids can be extremely powerful magic finders, um, and I've actually done it uh, several times, including, including during the beta. Um, I have a video up of me playing the zoo druid during the beta. Um, let's move on to the Necromancer, which is probably one of the most powerful skill-based early ladder characters in the game. And quite honestly, I think the Necromancer is quite probably the strongest early ladder character, bar none, including against Sorceress. Now you might be asking yourself, well, why am I rating the Necromancer so high? Well, just like the Zoo Druid, the Necromancer also has an army. He can summon forth a massive number of skeletons, skeletal mages, revives, clay golem, fire golem, blood golem, uh, you know, iron golem. He can beef up them to a massive degree, and for the most part, you can actually be completely naked. And I mean that. I actually have a Necromancer. I named him the Naked Mancer. And his entire goal in life is just to laugh at uh, at the world and be naked and, and, and just explode people's corpses. And quite honestly, as a Necromancer early ladder, you really have a really easy time gearing yourself up. Most people are playing sorceresses, paladins, barbarians. And when a wand drops or a, a Necromancer head drops, they don't want it. They, they, don't, they don't care about that stuff, and you are more likely to get that equipment as well. Um, I have used Necromancers to gear up my other characters many, many times at the beginning of a season, and, uh, and quite honestly, it is an extremely easy thing to do. You can build Corpse Explosion, you can build Skeletons, um, you can build a little bit of Bone Prison to help out to hold targets so that they can't get to you, and you have just a cornucopia of utilitarian curses. Um, you've got the ability to amplify damage, you've got the ability to decrepify, you have the ability to lower resistances, you can confuse targets, you can attract targets, you can blind targets. I mean, just in general, the Necromancer is a Swiss army knife of a character, especially early ladder, when everybody is usually having issues, you're not. You're the necromancer. You're the king of the army. You are literally commanding your, your army into battle like the general, and when people are having issues, you are there with the right curse at the right time to help them out, and it's amazing. Um, who have we not done yet? 
We did the uh, Necromancer, we did the Sorceress, we did the Paladin, we did the Barbarian, uh, we did the Amazon, and uh, we're missing somebody. Uh, we also did the Assassin, so I think the only one that we're missing is uh, as a Druid and a Paladin. <laughs> Sometimes finding the one that I'm missing is the hardest. You know what? Let's do this. How about this? Aha! Look at this beautifulness. That's right. We did the Amazon. Uh, we did the Assassin. We did the Necromancer. Did the Barbarian. Did the Paladin. Did the Sorceress. And did the Druid. So we did them all then. Uh, so let's move on to the next tip, which is don't forget your quests. Alright, so there are a lot of quests in the game that give you bonuses. And you really need to make sure that you don't forget them. Um, there is a free skill point that you get at Act 1 from the Den of Evil. Now, I don't think most people forget this one, although sometimes they do. And uh, I'm going to pull up the quest panel here so we can really talk about these. So, Den of Evil, you get one skill point. And it might not seem like an awful lot, but it can add up, especially over three difficulties. If you didn't get it, uh, that's three skill points that you would be missing. Um, also, uh, early on in the game, uh, the killing the... Uh, Blood Raven and getting yourself a free merc it can be extremely useful, especially if you can find a couple gems like uh, little chipped lightning gems or, or topazes or, or uh, you know sapphires or rubies. Um, it can be really, 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 really handy to get uh, a three socket bow with some chip gems and a, a, a bow girl early on. She can make a huge difference in your kill speed. Um, also, uh, make sure that you do the uh, Radiment quest, which is another free skill point. Uh, again, that's three more skill points. So if you don't do Radiment, that's literally one, two, three for Den of Evil, one, two, three for uh, for for Radiment Slayer. That's six skill points you'd be missing out on, which is pretty big. Um, also, make sure you do the um, Golden Bird quest in Act Three, which is free twenty HP, and do your Gibbon quest. We talked about that earlier for your free ring, free rare ring, uh, which is pretty darn important. Also, grab the Lama Sem's Tome for an extra five stat points, which also so it's over all three difficulty settings, which is another 15 bonus stat points that you can get in either strength, dex, or, or vitality, or spread between all of them. Um, also, make sure you kill Iswal. He is worth two skill points. That is another two, four, six skill points that you would be missing if you didn't kill him in all three difficulty settings. And keep in mind, that's a lot of skill points. If you count up the three from Den of Evil, the three from uh, Radiment, and the six from uh, from Iswal, that's 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's 12 skill points you would be missing out on if you didn't do these quests. So do the quests. Uh, we also have the Hellforge, which we talked about earlier, for the free runes and the free uh, gems. Definitely very important to do that one as well, especially early ladder when you're hurting for all this stuff. Um, and then in Act 5, make sure you do your um, rescue on Mount Ariat quest to get your free route or tell. It's a pretty big boon early on and can get you that, uh, say, uh, Ancient's Pledge or Spirit or any other nice piece of gear early on to really make your character do well. Also, make sure you do your Anya quest, the Prison of Ice quest. You get plus 10 to all resistances for each difficulty that you do the quest in for a total of plus 30. And when you get to hell difficulty and you get smacked in the face with that negative 100% enemy resistance or, or your resistance, essentially, um, that is a huge negative. You literally start out with negative 100 to begin with in hell difficulty. You need tons of resistances to counter that. And the 30 that you get from the three Anya's quests is going to be a really big deal. Now, granted, the one in hell difficulty is a little difficult to do, but that's where a good necromancer with a, a dim vision curse comes in handy. Um, <laughs> uh, get a teleport item. Uh, this is uh, another one of my tips, and, uh, and I do recommend that you get a teleport item. Um, teleport items are very, very useful for a myriad of reasons. Um, if you do not have a teleport item of some kind, there are quite a few different ways that you can get them. Um, number one, you can gamble them. Uh, you can gamble teleport amulets. I've actually been pretty successful at that. Uh, number two, you can shop for teleport staffs. So if you go to Drogden in Act 3, in normal difficulty, Drogden will more often than not have a teleport staff in his shop. Um, what you need to do is you need to run over to Drogden and you need to check his shop for a teleport staff. If he doesn't have one, leave town. You have to make sure that everyone is out of town, by the way, which is why it's better to do this in a, um, a single player game, basically. And what you're looking for is a staff that has teleport charges. I would recommend that you do this 
in normal difficulty because the price will be a little bit cheaper and also um, it's closer to where the charges spawn uh, I believe they're t level 24 is what the teleport staffs are uh, so when you get your ha hands on a teleport staff it's going to be a pretty big boon to you because you're going to be able to skip over certain pieces of content uh, especially if there are difficult monsters in the way maybe return to your corpse if needed um, you know there's a lot of different things that you could do with a teleport staff that can be extremely useful um, so what you do is you look in here for a teleport staff and then you run out of town just like this um, make sure that you see the little uh, words come up on the screen that say that you have left town, you know, entering Spider Forest, and you're good to go. Uh, you run back in, and he will have a new bevy of staves that uh, that you can shop yes. from. And, uh, and eventually, there will be a teleport charge staff in here. Um, as you can see, there is a sacrifice charge staff, not the one we want, but, uh, you know, I could, uh, I could do this for a little while and see if I could find one real quick. Why not? Greetings. All right, didn't even take me that long. It was only about five minutes, and I was able to find myself a gnarled staff of teleportation. Um, as you can see, it costs 189,932 gold, but it has level one teleport, 33 charges. Not bad. So I could uh, I could buy that, and then I could put that on my offhand, uh, make sure I have the teleport skill set, and I could use it to teleport when I need to. So I'm running around, you know, I'm attacking like this, I'm shooting my little blade furies out or whatever, I come across a river with no bridge, and I can swap, teleport, swap. Just like that. Um... Shopping for a teleport item is one way, but like I said, you can also gamble for it, or you can also find one. Um, when you get to Nightmare and Hell difficulty, I would recommend picking up just about every single uh, ring and amulet that you possibly can, and there's a reason for this, because there is a Herodric Cube recipe that involves transmuting amulets and rings back and forth. Now, this only works for blue rings, and it only works for blue amulets, but this is another way that you can find yourself a teleport amulet or something else very nice. It's also important to note that this is dependent on your level as a character, um, not the level of the item that you find. So when you are a low-level character, like for instance you're level 1 and you're finding all those really crappy rings and amulets that nobody wants, um, keep in mind that those really crappy rings and amulets that nobody wants could be very easily converted into something better later on down the road. Like, for instance, once you hit level 40, 30, or 40, you could start converting them and try to get yourself something better. So, for instance, if I take three blue rings as a level 99 character and I convert them in the stash, I can get potentially a very, very nice amulet. Um, and I did not, but that's okay. Then I take three blue amulets, and I can convert those and see if I can get a fairly nice ring. And I managed to get a ring with confused charges on it, which can actually be really handy in certain situations. But say I don't particularly want that. I could put it back in the cube again, and I could try to uh, to move on to get something better. Um, I would recommend that at a, as an early ladder character, you just go ahead and collect every single blue ring and every single blue amulet that you find, Put it in your your stash, and then transmute them once you hit level 30, and a lot of the times you will end up with something very nice to hang around your neck or to put on your finger. Um, another thing that I would like to go over is a properly geared mercenary goes a long way. Um, a lot of people make the mistake of not properly getting or gearing up a mercenary early on. And I want to say uh, to those people, that's silly. Um, mercenaries are extremely useful and can be extremely useful if they are properly geared and, and they are properly set up. Uh, for instance, if I was a, um, a, a zoo druid or a necromancer, one thing that I might do early on is I might get myself a bow girl and get her an edge bow, which is an extremely easy rune word to make. It is tier Tal Am. Tier Tal Am is, uh, is not that hard to come by, and Am is probably the hardest to find rune in that recipe. However, giving my minions, my army, level 15 thorns is an extremely useful thing uh, for a, a low-level zoo druid. Um, and it's something that you could definitely get a lot of good use out of. Of course, you have to keep them alive. You have to keep them leveled up. One of the main issues that people have with keeping their mercenaries alive is a lot of the times they're underleveled. Uh, mercenaries suffer the same penalties that everyone else does. So, for instance, when you're in Act 1 Normal Difficulty, and you finally make it to Act 2 Normal Difficulty, right? And you've got your mercenary, and she's level 12, and you're level 14. There is a penalty for anyone under level 14. And you will not level up. 
you will not level up very well at all. And your mercenary who is level 12 is getting next to no EXP. And so by the time you hit level 18 and your mercenary is still level 12 and she's doing very poorly, it's because she is just going to be getting no exp from anything you kill what you have to do is you have to yes, refresh yes. her so either resummon her or get a new mercenary so what you got to do is you got to take off all her equipment make sure you take off her equipment because otherwise she's going to lose it um, and hire yourself a new one and then when you hire yourself a new one pick your equipment back up and put I it back on her um, this is because when you rehire her she will be closer to your actual level and this enables you to actually Put keep her very close Put to your use. level. If she's not at your level or if she's if she's too low level for the zone, she's going to have a lot of issues. And the reason for this is because mercenaries get a lot of different things as they level up. They get stat points as they level up in strength and dexterity. They also get resistances as they level up and higher points in their skills. So if you have an underleveled Merc, that means your Merc is going to be lower on dex, lower on strength, lower on HP, and lower on resistances, which means they're generally just going to do very poorly. And then on top of that, their skills won't be as high level, which means they're not even going to be that useful. So make sure you keep your Mercenary uh, at your level uh, at the very least and also get them some good equipment um, putting a nice set of equipment on your mercenary can literally change your entire play having a good tank on a sorceress like for instance a mercenary that can hang in there and tank a boss um, is a huge boon to a character who doesn't otherwise have any kind of tanking monsters. Especially when you go up against Duriel for the first time, having a mercenary that can actually tank Duriel is a really big boon. Uh, versus, um, you know, having nothing and you end up running around the map like a chicken with your head cut off. Um, there are tons of ways you can gear up your mercenary, obviously. There are rune words like stealth, uh, malice. There are rune words uh, like nadir. There are also uh, unique items that you can find along the way, like, for instance, a blood thief brandy stock, uh, crown of thieves, uh, undead crown, all sorts of very interesting things, which I have videos on all of them, by the way. So feel free to look them up and, uh, and have, a, have a heyday. Um, I'm trying to see if I missed anything here. I do believe there's at least one more thing for us to go over. And I think this is going to be my last point, my tenth point. And that is teamwork and trade can take you really far. So don't underestimate how valuable an item is. If I found a plus one to summoning skills 40 life skiller, it might not necessarily be good to me. I might be a necromancer or a paladin, and I might not know anybody who is, you know, using these particular items. But if I find one, there's a very good chance that there's somebody out there who does want this and who will would be willing to trade something to me to get it. So keep in mind value of items to other players. Also, another thing that I have noticed on my many, many, many playthroughs of Diablo 2 is that the game just loves to give you stuff that's not for you. I say you're a barbarian and you want to be a mace class barbarian and you're leveling up and the only thing that seems to drop for you are necromancer items. Or you're playing a bow Amazon and the only thing that seems to drop for you are, are uh, you know, javelins and, uh, you know, like, like really, really nice shields and stuff that you can't use. Um, I have noticed this on a regular basis that literally when you are playing the game, the game will give you what you do not need. And if you hold on to these items that you do not need and you share them with your team, a lot of the times they will have items that they also do not need, and you can do very well trading back and forth between team members. Um, the same thing goes for trading with other people. Um, I feel like this game was almost designed in a way to recognize what character you're playing and go, hey, we're not going to give you the item that you want. We're going to give that item to that guy, and you're going to have to trade for it later. Um, there are a lot of good items that you can trade for early starter gear, and there are a lot of generic items which are generally good for most people. Like, for instance, Harlequin Crest Shaco is a generically good item that just about all characters can get good use out of. Um, a, uh, a Spirit Monarch Shield, very, very good generic item that a lot of people can get good use out of. Um, something like this, like the Summoning Skills Charm, is only going to be good to a summon druid. Um, it does have trade value, but it's not going to be very good for uh, the majority of the players in the game. So keep in mind that things like this 
you're going to want to hold on to. Um, if you ever find one of these, by the way, definitely hold on to that because that's worth a ton of money. Um, I mean, real life dollars, <laughs> especially if you find it in ladder. So, uh, so grats. Um, in closing, uh, this video has been going for almost an hour, so let me go ahead and tie this up in a bow, shall I? Uh, ladder is an amazing experience, but it is also an experience that is short. Uh, it's only going to be four months from what I remember. It is also an experience where you know, you are basically shoved in like a brand new character. Um, if you've ever played an MMO, if you've ever played um, you know, a, a game where you had to start out fresh and you uh, all you had was the starter items and people were making fun of you because you didn't have X God item in your inventory, um, that's kind of what Ladder is like, except everybody is forced into this peasant world, and uh, and we are all but country knights in the beginning. Um, now, as you level up your character, as you become stronger, as you become a better player, um, you will be more and more apt to uh, to you know build your character the way that you want. But when you first start ladder, a lot of the times it is a struggle. It is a a very fun struggle though, and I think that is the most important thing. Um, definitely check down in the description for links to the videos. I'm going to have a large number of videos down there, different resources and, uh, and things for you guys to use to, um, to get a better idea of, um, of what you're doing. Uh, we still have, uh, you know, today is the 13th, so we still have basically, what, like two weeks? We've got like two weeks until ladder starts, so you've got plenty of time to catch up and, uh, and do a little bit of research. As always, I do appreciate you guys and gals watching my videos, even when they're an hour long. And as always, keep watching.